Good evening. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you here and invite you back at any opportunity to be here. As mentioned on our sick list this morning, uh, Don is doing much better battling his bout with COVID. Traveling out of town, Lou will be going out of town tomorrow for the next few days. Susan Windhorse is out of town, Tracy Walker, the Romine family, the Valenzuela family, and David Griffin's family. It's good to see Tim and Stacy here with us, and glad you all could stop in and be with us. Serving tonight, Mike Redmond is in the audio-visual booth. Mark Huber will be leading us in singing. Parker Windhorse has the opening prayer, Pat Windhorse the closing prayer. Brandon Crow will present preside at the Lord's Supper, and Ron will be bringing us the lesson. Is there anything further I need to announce? Group four, Group four meets tonight, all in service. Mark? Our God, he is alive. Be our first song of selection.
After this song, we'll have the opening prayer followed by the Lord's Supper. Savior, lead me lest I stray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. Thank you so much for your Son, who was a perfect example for us and sent here to die on the cross so we may forgive us of our sins. Dear Lord, we, many of our number are sick or traveling, and if it be your will, please bring them back to us. Dear Lord, we pray for this church and its leadership. May you bless the elders and their families with health and wisdom that they may continue to make decisions so this church can be a light in this community and bring more souls to you. We also pray for Carlos and Arlene and may you, you give them health and passion to continue to do your will and present lessons to us to help us grow. Dear Lord, we pray for Christians around the world. Please help strengthen their faith, especially Christians who have to worship where they worry about their safety. May you bless them and strengthen them. We pray for those that have fallen away or those 
whose lights are flickering. May you give them more time. May you give us the wisdom and the courage to go to them and give us the words to say that can prick their heart so we can bring them back to you before it is eternally too late. Lord, as we continue through this service, we pray that everything we do is pleasing to you. We pray that you forgive us of any sin that separates us from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have this time set aside for uh, anyone who has not had the opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper to do so. Uh, is there anyone here tonight that would like to? Uh, to help prepare our minds, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink the, this, if, I'm sorry, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup. Please pray with me. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity you've given us this evening to reflect on the life and death and resurrection of your son for the sacrifice he gave, for the body that he broke on our account, for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray, Lord, as we take this bread, that we do so in a worthy manner that is pleasing to you. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray again. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you again as we take this cup, this symbol of your son's blood who was spilt on our account for the sins that we committed that put him on that cross. Father, we are so grateful that he made that sacrifice willingly for the love he has for us, for the opportunity we have to join you in heaven one day. Again, we pray that we take this in a pleasing manner to you in a worthy manner that is representative of what you want for us. It's through your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
when I was in everybody said on this side and I, I teased them then about the building tilting over and and and, uh, and I reminded them that the sheep are on the right hand and the goats are on the left and so so here we've got all these sheep and these other sheep. <laughs> I'm not about to call you goats, because I know you're not. You're sheep. Appreciate you being here this evening. We appreciate our visitors very much. We're glad that you came to be with us. Uh, some come a long, long way. Glad to see you again. This preaching thing is new to me. I've got to figure out everything, what to do up here. What do you see there? I've, I've, I've pulled this on you before. Uh, I've used different images. Uh, but what do you see? Uh, you see a, like a candy dish? It's got, you know, and, uh, like a cup thing. Or do you see two faces facing each other? And what this does, is, we got a lot of people saying, <laughs> what this does, it shows us that we all have different perspectives, how we see things. And one of the interesting things about uh, the differences in gender is that women are more use more of their right brain, and men tend to use more of their left brain. Now, that's not 100%, but it's predominant, predominantly that way. And we've done series before on, on male and female, and it shows the difference in the way that we see things and the way that we reason. So I want to talk tonight about a matter of perspective, and, and uh, most people realize that everybody has a different So if you'll take out your songbooks, <laughs> can you cue that up for me, please, rather than me trying to go all the way through that? Stand by, we're having technical difficulties. Okay. We have our own perspective, our self-perspective, then there's everybody else's perspective, other people, and then there's God's perspective. So I want to talk about these tonight, consider these three different perspectives, and first we'll talk about our self-perspective. Do you ever know anybody that just everything that happened to them was just negative, that, you know, and, and everything's just negative, 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 and... Uh, Reminds me of the story uh, about, uh, about this family that had two little girls. And it was, they were twin girls, and it was their birthday, their birthday being on the same time, and so they're going to give them gifts. Well, one, one little girl was just completely negative about everything, and the other little girl was positive about everything. And so... They gave them gifts, and the little, the little negative girl opened up her gift, and, uh, and uh, there was a puppy inside. And she said, oh, no. Now I've got something I have to look after, and, and you know, puppies, they don't last very long, and they're just trouble, and... And I, I, sorry, I got a puppy. And the other little girl opened up her, her package, and it was horse pebbles. And she said, oh, boy, I got horse pebbles. I got horse pebbles. And the parents said, well, what are you excited about horse pebbles? She said, well, there's horse pebbles. There's a pony somewhere. <laughs> so... It depends upon whether a person has a positive aspect or a negative aspect about 
what they see. And some people, they, everything's negative. When God called Moses to deliver the children from Israel, and we've just been studying this from Exodus, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 11, Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? I mean, we talked about this in Wednesday night class, that here's a man who sees a bush that is burning, and it's not being consumed, and a voice speaks to him out of that bush, and he's going to argue with it. The voice says, I'm going to send you back to deliver the children from Israel. And Moses says, what? Who am I that I should do this thing? And Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1, God kept saying, telling him, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to send you. Moses entered and said, <coughs> But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. And so, you know, he was, of course, he was very hesitant. Moses said to the Lord again, verse 10, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you've spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. So first of all, who am I? Second of all, what if they don't believe me? And third of all, well, I'm not a very good speaker anyway. I'm not very eloquent. So some people, you know, when they are challenged by something, and particularly when they're challenged by something that the person that's challenging them knows they can do. And the reason why often, of course, they have that negative perspective is because they lack confidence in themselves. And it's amazing to think that Moses would lack confidence in himself, but when you look at his life, what he's been through and everything, here he is now, you know, herding goats and sheep. And he didn't feel like that he was a leader, even though he had been trained in all the ways of Pharaoh's house. But some people then only see the positive, as like the little girl with, with the, you know, the horse chip. Like Jephthah, for instance. In Je Judges 11, verse 30 and 31, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then I will be that whatever, it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, sh shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. And so Jephthah could only see a positive result out of God delivering the people of Ammon into his hand, him being victorious in this battle. And of course, he didn't see the end result of that, did he? The end result was, as he gave vow to God that whatever greets him as he comes back from the battle, he'd offer up in burnt sacrifice, it turned out to be his only daughter that came to meet him. So, even with a positive outlook on things, we don't know how things are going to turn out. We don't know the end of the matter because our self-perspective is dependent upon limited knowledge and experience. And we may, uh, we may have a perspective that others don't have, and that's a good time to speak, but we don't know the future like Jephthah. So everybody needs to recognize that our own experience, our own knowledge, whatever knowledge we've gained and whatever experience we have is limited. And we can't know the positive or the negative of everything. We can consider and try to weigh out the outcome of different things, but we can't know for sure. Now. Do you have an open mind? Some people claim to be open-minded, but whenever you present them with facts, they refuse to listen, just shut you down. We have an old saying, and that is, don't confuse me with facts, my mind is already made up. That's someone who is so sure of their own perspective that they can't believe that there's any other element of truth 
that might be presented to them or any other perspective that might be presented to them that's better than their own. So there are others' perspectives. <coughs> and like I said, we don't know what another person's perspective is. Everybody can understand their own perspective. You've heard me say before, ask the question, who's the wisest person in the room? And you all know the answer to that, don't you? Yeah. And the reason why I think I'm the wisest person in the room is because I understand every bit of my own perspective. Everything that I believe I have, in my opinion, carefully weighed out, looked at all the pros and cons and the evidence and the facts, and I've made a decision that this is true or this isn't true. And that's true of everybody. I understand my perspective, you understand your perspective, but do you understand that there could be another perspective? King Rehoboam was confronted with a dilemma. <coughs> Let's read the verse. 1 Kings 12, verses 4 and 5. Your father has made your yoke heavy. Now therefore, lighten... I'm sorry. <coughs> I, uh, I didn't cough a whole lot this morning, but I, but I am this, this evening. And I think it's because I get all warmed up. So... This is why preachers wear long sleeves. But not really, but it's why this preacher wears long sleeves. What's happened is that Rehoboam has become king. He is the son of Solomon, become king over all of Israel. And the people have come to Rehoboam and asked him, they're asking him, to lower their taxes. David and Solomon both had raised taxes. David raised taxes in order to raise an army. Solomon raised taxes in order to build the temple. And so they have come to him and they've said to Rehoboam, <coughs> Your father made our yoke heavy, our burden. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us and we will serve you. We'll be glad to make you king. So he said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. Now Solomon sought the advice of two different groups of people. He sought the advice of the advisors, the old men that had served Solomon. And he sought the advice then of his contemporaries, his peers, the younger men. So we read in 1 Kings 12, verses 12 through 14, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly. <coughs> and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. Now, whose perspective did Rehoboam follow? Of course, he followed the perspective of the young men. Was that good advice? Did he really consider where the perspective was coming from? Did he really consider... Who was saying what? I think we all understand that people with the most experience uh, generally have the most wisdom. By that I mean regards to how the world works. People who have been through various different scenarios through life 
people who have raised families and people who have gone through hard times as well as good times and sacrifices as well as blessings can understand how those things work, how they came about. When we look at the scriptures, of course, we see uh, how that God, in regards to those who would be leaders in His church, said they're going to be elders, the elderly. They're going to be the ones with the experience. And he, and he qualifies what that experience is to show the result of their experience, their family life, and so on and so forth. So here, Jeroboam, <coughs> does not consider the perspective of the elderly men, counselors, but of the younger ones. So this is a time to listen. Unfortunately, of course, Rehoboam did not listen to the right perspective. The king did not listen to the people, chapter 12 and verse 15. And others can't see the future either. You can't see the future, and other people can't see the future. The best that we can do is go by the best perspective or the best advice that we might consider and how it's going to work out. And that's, again, one of the reasons why those who have more experience uh, have the, sometimes the better perspective. Thank you, sir. I do have a lozenge in my mouth for those of you reaching for lozenges. I have one in my mouth. is they have enough experience to realize the result of certain actions. Well, let's consider God's perspective. Before I go any further, I want to recall the account of Job. You're all familiar, I believe, most of you are familiar with the account of Job. Here Job is living his life upon the earth, and this is dated about 2000 B.C., and uh, Satan, his angels, have access to the throne of God. And God is there with, with his angels, the sons of God, it talks about. And Satan comes along with his, <coughs> with his entourage. And uh, God says, where have you been? Well, I've been down on the earth, walking to and fro upon the earth which, by the way, he still does. And God said, well, did you behold my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth, a man who is upright in all of his ways. And Satan says, well, the only reason that he's upright in all of his ways, and the only reason he serves you is because you've blessed him. He's a wealthy man. He has a good family. He, everything's going good for Job. You, you let me get a hold of him and... <coughs> <coughs> I hope that doesn't bother you as much as it does me. It's bothering me a lot. I'm just going to cough my way through this. My deepest apologies. Satan says, you let me get a hold of him and you let me touch him. And uh, he, won't be, he won't be so faithful to you anymore. God says you can do anything you want with him, but you can't take his life. Satan took everything Job had. Took his health, took his family, took his possessions. And so here's Job in a heap of ashes uh, with, with uh, sores all over him. And his friends come and they offer their perspective. And their perspective is what? Job, you've angered God. You've done something. You, you've sinned grievously against God. You need to repent, seek God's forgiveness, and then everything will get better. And Job's perspective was, if I've sinned against God, I don't know what it is. I have racked my brain and racked my brain and I can't figure out what I've done. I've, I've 
lived upright. As far as I know, I've lived upright all my life. And so all of his friends keep telling Job, you have made God angry. Job said, I don't understand what's going on here. I don't know why God has done this to me. Now that's Job's perspective. Why has God done this to me? Because I haven't done anything wrong. We're going to read some from Job in just a moment. God was the only one who knew all the facts in that situation. He knew why Job was going through what he was going through, and he knew how Job was going to react. He knew the facts that included the future. You see, God knew Job's heart. He knew the kind of man he was. And he knew that whatever Satan did to him, Job was going to remain steadfast to him. Isaiah 42, verses 8 and 9. God said to Isaiah, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things I have have come to pass, and new things I declare... Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. God's the only one that knows what's going to be the outcome of whatever activity happens upon the face of the earth. So what does God say about my perspective, about a person's self-perspective? James chapter 4 and verse 6. He gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So what God is saying is, don't be so conceited about your own perspective. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What does God say about the other person's perspective? Philippians 3, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Now, how does this play out in regards to this perspective idea? Well, it plays out like this. I don't become so high-minded and so conceited and egotistical that I think that my perspective is always the best. But rather, I'm willing to, in lowliness of mind and humility, Listen to what others may say. Now, in listening to what others may say, of course, and we've got to look at at the context of what Paul is writing here, we're listening not to ungodly people, but to people who have shown godliness in their life, who have shown that they want to do the will of God and they're seeking to follow the will of God. I'm not going to listen to someone who is... Uh, steeped in ungodliness who's going to come along and give me some advice uh, and particularly worldly advice. Did you ever have one of those days? I don't even know how I did that. Now, if I really believed that Satan in every way he could was trying to hinder a message, God is telling us that we need to be cautious about just taking our perspective and not willing to listen to another's perspective. I'm not going to have a drunkard come to me and tell me how I need to conduct my life. I'm not going to have an immoral man come and tell me how I need to conduct my, my family life. And you know, whenever we recognize the 
humanism and the ungodliness that is pervasive in regards to much of our psychological field, sociological field, we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of where the advice is coming from. Is it coming from a human perspective or is it coming from God's perspective? So what does God say about His perspective? Jeremiah 17 verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So when we try to follow our own heart, God says our heart's deceitful. Obviously, we live in a physical world and physical bodies, and when we start listening just to that, we can get ourselves into trouble. We're being deceived. And as I said, perhaps <coughs> perhaps Job said it best in Job 28, verses 12 and 13, but where can wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value nor is it found in the land of the living. Why? Why is wisdom in the place of understanding not found in the land of the living? Because we don't know the future. We are living a life of experimentation in many ways. We experiment and find out what activity will bring about what result. Can anybody foresee, for instance, what the future of America is? Or can anybody foresee what the future of the stock market is? We go by the history of things. We know that things wax and wane. And we do that based upon, again, the experience and the knowledge of history. But we don't know the future. And so... The idea of wisdom and understanding, Job said, not found in the land of the living. Job 28, verse 20 through 24. For where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. <coughs> Destruction and death say, we have heard a report about it with our ears. God understands its way and He knows its place, for He looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heavens. Job realized that in the end that his and others' perspective was erroneous. Everything that they thought, the reason why things were happening to Job, they each had their perspective, but all perspectives were wrong. Job 42 verses 2 through 6 God, here Job's speaking to God. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. <coughs> you asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen please and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dusts and ashes. Now, why did Job come to this conclusion? He mentions here that God said, I will question you and you shall answer me. And the questions were, where were you when the foundation of the earth was formed? Where were you when the waters divided from the lands? Where were you when the animals were made? Where were you when, when the lion uh, took care of its cub or when the ostrich took care of its young? Where were you when all of the things of creation came about and how things continue to exist and consist in the creation. What do you have to do with any of that? Do you teach the animal world how to care for their young? 
do you provide for their sustenance? Do you provide for their welfare? And Job realized how limited his experience and perspective, his wisdom and his knowledge was. And so that's when he said, I abhor myself. I tried to speak of things that I have no understanding about. We must be aware or beware of our own perspectives. Isaiah 5, verse 21, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. I mentioned this morning uh, uh, Jordan Peterson. And the reason I, I, I mention him, I admire him so much as someone who is a searcher. Now, Jordan Peterson has not come yet, as far as I've understood from what he's been saying, he's not yet come to admit that he believes the Bible is the Word of God. He believes the Bible has some excellent teaching in it. He believes a lot of what the Bible says. But he's not yet come full process to believing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah, even though he is considering what Jesus did and, and, and who he was. Some years ago, I preached a series on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and among the proofs of, of the resurrection that we have, of course, are the fact that uh, his disciples were willing to die rather than recant, that they had seen him rise from the grave. His, his own brothers uh, didn't believe in him as the Messiah until after his resurrection. Then they did. And there are, <coughs> were atheists, uh, smart, educated men, doctors and lawyers and such, who were atheists, and they began to try to disprove what the Bible taught about Jesus and about the resurrection, and they became, uh, in the end, believers. C.S. Lewis is one. Uh, the author of Ben-Hur uh, was another. Can't think of his name right offhand, but you can look it up. And others that, that I presented in that series of lessons who became believers in the resurrection of Jesus Christ simply because... They examine the evidence, and that's where Jordan Peter, Peterson is. He is on a journey of belief. And you have to admire someone who has come from a background of believing uh, in the theories that humanity puts up, being an atheist, someone who didn't believe in God, turning into an agnostic, well, maybe I don't have all the answers, and finally... Yes, there is a creator. There is a God. So you have to admire someone who's that honest. And we have to ask ourselves, are we that honest? Do we look at all the evidence and follow the evidence that's out there regarding God and Jesus Christ? We all have our own perspective. It's wise to listen to the perspective of others because they may have knowledge or experience that I don't have. But it's wisest to listen to God's perspective because He alone knows the future. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, and said that godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Anyone that's lived a life following the teachings of Jesus Christ know the truth of that statement, of how that living the kind of life that God prescribes, called godliness or godlike, 
Anyone that lives that life knows that that is the best life. Whenever you look back and you see the results of living a life like that, and you examine the life of others who have lived a life like that, you see that it's the best life that there is. Human beings are have a phrase, feet made of clay. We, we, we are not perfect. We're imperfect beings. And so the best that we can do is to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ to the best of our ability and to make corrections when we err, when we fail to be what we ought to be, when we make those corrections, we always see that that was the best thing to do, to make the correction, to get away from whatever error it was that we were involved in. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, after Solomon had had written about all the experimentation that he had gone through, he was the probably the richest man that's ever lived and will ever live. He could do anything he wanted to do, and he pretty much did. And his conclusion was, it's all vain. It's all worthless. There's no benefit in it under the sun, he said. And he said, there's nothing new under the sun. We think that because of our modern technology, we've got something new that humanity has never had. We do have technology they never had, but guess what? We don't have a different kind of life than anybody else ever had. We still have to eat. We still have to drink. We still have to keep ourselves warm in the winter, cool in the summer. It doesn't matter how we do it. Solomon was able to be just as comfortable as we are with our modern innovations. And he ended up, after experimenting everything, all you got to do is read Ecclesiastes, he experienced everything that a person can do, and he wrote, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And that is really the point of the lesson. If only people would be as open-minded as they say they are. I hope to be, I strive to be as open-minded as I say I am. I've examined many scientific things and, and uh, tried, to, tried to be open-minded about life. We only have one of those, you know. And you don't have to live very long to realize that life doesn't last very long. When you're young and you're invincible and you think that you'll never die, just wait around a couple of years and you'll figure out that life wanes, that nothing lasts forever. And that there is a way of life that is right. And the only way to prove it is to live it. We challenge you to do that. If you believe that God is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him, that Jesus Christ is His only begotten Son, if you're willing to repent of sin and confess that faith before this audience tonight, we invite you to arise and be baptized to wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, being washed clean, By the blood of the Lamb, as we stand and sing this song, please come forward.
meet again on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for Bible study. I'd like to invite you back at that time. I'd like to thank Ron for uh, standing in for Carlos to today for both lessons. You made it through. so <laughs> I know it's a struggle, but uh, we appreciate your effort and diligence making it through that, that lesson. Very, very good information, both, uh, both sermons today. Group four meets after services for a few minutes. There's nothing further, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to be here today to worship you and hear your word proclaimed. We pray, dear God, that you be with us as we depart from this place, be our guest in our homes and in our lives, direct our feet in the way they should go. Let us be the examples you would want us to be to those round about us. Forgive us of our sins, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen.